everybody and welcome to this uh, new webinar of the Forest Landscape Restoration Working Group. The webinar focuses uh, mainly on the links between uh, forest landscape restoration and land tenure security. That's uh, why that's a little bit the different public than from the previous webinars. Uh, the more people from the um, uh, land tenure uh, working groups. The structure is similar uh, as the last times. Uh, we're going to start with a couple of presentations on the on the subject. Um, the first one will be from uh, Jenny Rust, uh, which who will, who will talk about um, uh, make a brief presentation on the of the global program on sustainable man land management, uh, especially the country program uh, component here in uh, in Madagascar. And the second one will be uh, presented by Steve Laurie from uh, C4 um, and will present the findings uh, of recent C4 research uh, on land tenure uh, security in Madagascar also. Uh, then after that, we will have, uh, as usual, um, a short question and answer session. Uh, where the participants can ask uh, some detail, more detailed questions to the to the presenters. Without delaying too much, I will give over to uh, Jenny Rust, who is going to present the global program sustainable land management and country program in uh, the country component in Madagascar. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for participating in uh, the webinar on uh, land tenure security in FLR. Very happy to be with you and um, being able to share uh, one of exam our examples uh, from a project in uh, Madagascar. Um, the project in Madagascar is one of the country components of the global project Responsible Land Policy. And uh, we are working on the uh, link between uh, land policy and FLR. And um, in the next few minutes, I'm going to give you some examples of our work and let you know um, by starting with the context in Madagascar on tenure rights in FLR. In Madagascar, um, or Madagascar itself is a, a founding member of the AFR 100 initiative and has committed itself to restore 4 million hectares of degraded lands and forest landscapes until 2030. Um, so this is one of the main issues on policy level for our project. Um, there has been a lot of engagement in the institu institutional setup. A national FLR committee has been um, provided and set up a regional exchange initi in initiated as well. And uh, there has been a national FLR strategy that has been developed by the uh, environmental ministry of Madagascar. So one of the main issues in this FLR national strategy that was uh, also supported by GRZ and set up in 2017 is that uh, securing land property rights and land use rights have been yeah have been identified as a, as a key issue so they're an integral part of the FLR process and um, the assumption is as well that um, restoration activities uh, in the long term to be successful um, successfully implemented that they require um, also um, a certain base of uh, land security. So we uh, in the project work um, basically in the, in the legal framework uh, and one major um, topic that we tackle in the project is that uh, the current uh, land policy in Madagascar allows farmers and smallholders to hold uh, land use certificates, mainly in the rural areas and uh, they definitely provide land security and land access um, and can also help, for example, to get bank credits, etc. So the ProPFR project in Madagascar, um, which is under the initiative uh, One Word No Hunger um, from BMZ, has a budget of 5.5 million euros and we started the project in July 2017 and it will end in, uh, in October 2021. We work in northwestern Madagascar and the Bueni region where we have eight uh, pilot communities and we closely work, or our political partner is the Ministry um, for Land Use Planning, which is also taking care of uh, land use rights, or tenure rights. We consider it as a precondition for promoting forest landscape restoration. So the overall um, objective is to improve secured access to land for the population of the Bueni region, so our eight communities particularly for women in marginalized groups. If you have a look at the project components, you will see that uh, the first and the second one are mainly uh, focusing on institutional frameworks, so the political um, 
um, work we do um, for our partner or with our partner and also um, strengthening the participation of the civil society to be, become more engaged in land uh, policy dialogue. The second one then focuses really on integrating securing land rights and land use rights and pilot measures of FLR. So this is the component, component which is most interesting for, for the participants of this webinar. To give you some, a selection of activities that we do, um, now it's mixed between the components, but we work on land inventory and conflict resolution, what I just said, also on uh, promoting uh, the civil society. And uh, two um, activities that are interesting for the um, context uh, of working on the link between tenure security and FLR is that we'll be working on um, on an FLR catalog, which is uh, which should be really a handy manual in the end, where land users can see what is the most appropriate option to a, a land tenure option uh, with regard to the different FLR options that I would have, or the other way around. If I'm already engaged in FLR, how could I possibly secure also my my land? that I'm working on. So this is one of the core activities in the second component of the project. And obviously um, there's also an integration of uh, what we learn from uh, the different studies that we, um, we do in the, in the project. How can we feed those experiences focusing more on the land tenure aspect with regards to FLR into the ongoing um, dialogues on national or regional level. So we try also to, um, to make use of this information and, and find out more, obviously, on this link. And I think later in the presentation that is going um, to be given by C4, um, they will also go a bit more in detail into um, a collaboration and a scientific uh, study that we've supported to, to learn more on, on this uh, topic between FLR and tenure security. So one of the challenges that we've already um, identified uh, within the project is that um, we closely work with the environmental program, the bilateral environmental program PASH, and they, they support the spatial planning tools in the region and also community planning, land use planning. And um, from a land policy perspective, if you look at the legal framework and uh, the, the, all the information that is being gathered, um, you can see that there's a, a gap between land information that is uh, registered and also the realities on the ground. So that is important for us also in the context of the land inventory to, to uh, understand right away, um, does paper actually uh, um, yeah, is in line with uh, the reality on the ground or is there need for action maybe? We can also see that there is uh, of, um, obviously an in insufficient uh, capacities for implement implementation, uh, be it on the legal framework, uh, I would even say on the land tenure side, but also on the forestry side. And then we have another um, issue which is interesting because the Madagascar law um, also has a land regime on specific status areas, for example, protected areas or certain forests, etc. And they are not yet finalized or they need to be updated uh, with regards to the legal framework. So that is something that we um, try to also look into and feed uh, information into this from our work on the ground. So possible solutions that we've thought about so far, but obviously what I just mentioned, and we'll have uh, some more information in a couple of minutes uh, from the C4 um, studies, um, is yeah, possible solutions from our side would be definitely an intensified dialogue to find common ground or to understand also the different perspectives, be it, be it from the first three side or the land rights and land use planning perspective. Uh, we definitely see that there's uh, facilitation needed um, for land procedures and uh, have this link right uh, maybe at the beginning of um, yeah, lifting up projects, uh, FLR implementation projects and, and FLR practitioners that are involved in those projects. And um, we are trying to uh, contribute as well to, uh, to find sustainable and adequate solutions to make actually land use or land planning tools and um, information that is being fed into formal um, planning tools more reliable. So that was a short uh, yeah, insight into the project in Madagascar. Thank you for your attention. Uh, very happy to answer questions or um, learn from your experiences maybe from other countries. Thank you. So we go now over to uh, Steve Lowry, uh, who is going to uh, present us some findings on uh, research on FLR and ten land tenure security in Madagascar. Great. Oh, good morning, everyone. We're talking today about the relationship between tenure security and forest landscape restoration, and specifically on 
the role and importance of tenure security uh, in encouraging adoption of uh, forest landscape restoration practices. So we were aware, uh, especially in GIZ, of the importance of uh, the global commitments to forest landscape restoration. You're all familiar, of course, with the Bond Challenge, ambitious goals globally, uh, and to achieve them with respect to uptake of uh, the Bond Challenge uh, goals. Uh, there's going to be uh, some need for widespread and long-term behavioral changes in resource use and management. And it's pretty clear from our experience and our knowledge of, well, of human behavior that tenure rights can motivate long-term investments in restoring uh, deforested and degraded land. As a generalization, currently, rights to forests globally are held in the hands of the state. Uh, this is not only the case in the developing world, but in many parts of the, of the uh, of the uh, global north as well. And at C4, we've been seeing a, a relationship between the sort of uh, the, the range of rights that communities have and their ability to uh, participate in initiatives that encourage greater forest conservation. And we think that uh, certainly the question of the relationship between rights and forest management practices are important questions. So among the questions that we're asking, would a greater array of rights in the hands of communities provide more equitable li livelihood benefits? Or would they more likely uh, benefit women in marginalized communities? And would they contribute to better forest outcomes? So what is tenure? Well, tenure is a, really a social institution. They, they, they relate to the, uh, the social relations and institutions that govern access to and use of land and resources. So, just a little bit more on tenure security, reflects a right holder's confidence or belief, real or perceived, that agreed upon rights will be enforced and upheld by society more, more broadly. It reduces the uncertainties associated with making investments and increases the likelihood that rights holders will perceive that they will benefit from restoration in this particular case. Now, we've, there's a wonderful uh, set of research done by a group led by Baines uh, called Key Factors Which Influence the Success of Community Forestry in Developing Countries. And we use this as, as sort of a, a framing model for analyzing uh, the sort of uh, the probability that the right conditions exist in any context for successful uptake of community uh, forestry management practices. And I want to list these out for you. And the first one is and this is based, I should note, on very extensive comparative studies of community forestry programs in the Philippines, Nepal, and Mexico. Uh, and so the first is secure property, that is tree and land rights. And this is considered, of the five factors, a necessary factor. Uh, if it's absent, then it's very unlikely that your community um, uh, forestry initiatives will find much success. It's necessary, but not sufficient. So I want to make note of that also. Uh, a second condition is material benefits to community members. This is very important. Of course, it stands to reason. If you're asking people to invest time, money, effort to forgo using land for purposes other than forests, for instance, then there must be tangible material benefits accruing to community members. This is also a necessary condition. So if these two conditions are not met, uh, then it's unlikely that uh, any sort of uh, uh, initiatives will get very far. Importantly, with respect to material benefits to community members, we found that those benefits much, must be widely distributed among all community members who have a stake and who have standing in the community. And so this relates to the third point, socioeconomic status and gender-based inequality, where, of course, it's vital that benefits reach every section of the community, but where they don't, uh, then it's very unlikely that the program will be successful because successful community forest projects need to have the participation of everyone in the community to ensure the kinds of management outcomes as well as the social outcomes that we're all seeking. Fourth, uh, the importance of intercommunity user group governance is very uh, important. This relates to some extent to the third point. Uh, the there always or typically usually needs to be uh, a, a legitimate local government governance entity uh, that takes responsibility for managing uh, the use of, uh, of, of forests uh, to some sort of uh, purpose and sustainability sort of outcome. 
but that community also has to be, that user group structure has to be seen as legitimate by all members of the community uh, as well as the poor. And then finally, government support uh, is, is important. You know, I talk a lot about tenure because that's my field, but you know, there's a tendency to see tenure as sort of, I'll use the term silver bullet, that if there's sort of secure tenure that everything's going to be fine. But we know that's just one condition uh, necessary for achievement of, of, uh, of better outcomes uh, environmentally and socially. Government support is vital, for instance, in helping create a regulatory environment that does, in fact, uh, recognize and respect the rights that have been devolved. We also find that many forest agencies, if you will, I'll use the term, haven't got the memo, that it's sort of a new world, that communities have new kinds of rights and, and obligations and authority over forests in a, in a historical context where, where there was very strong direct regulation from forest departments with respect to forest use. So I think there's significant opportunity for GIZ and other organizations to invest in reforms of, of, of practice within forestry agencies because there's a need to come to relate to communities in different kinds of ways, not as regulators or, or policing authorities. There's always a role for the state to ensure good environmental outcomes, but importantly, they need to relate to communities uh, as partners who are taking the lead. And so this relates to capacity building locally, uh, training, uh, education, uh, support of a regulatory environment. So those are the five conditions, and I hope you found that sort of summary useful. So tenure and governance and FLR uh, practices that you were speaking about the enabling conditions for FLR. We found that with respect to the first point, the kind of, uh, if you will, the, the depth and sophistication of the analyses of security of tenure in the Rome diagnostics were, as a generalization, quite weak. Uh, the diagnostics, as you might expect, tended to really focus largely on the biophysical uh, questions and not so much on the social economic questions. And there's a whole array of questions in the realm that, that are re related to economy, finance, and rights. So this is something we note. I also want to note that the Madagascar realm, which the GIs had supported, was not included. Uh, it, we didn't have access to it at the time of our study, but it did a very good job of taking account of rights and tenure issues. Okay. So here's a bit on governance and uh, tenure and FLR in practice. Speaking about two cases here very briefly. First, I want to speak about um, Ghana. So we found, uh, and others have found, uh, a couple of important barriers to FLL uptake in Ghana. For instance, communities lacked formally recognized tenure rights to forests, and merchantable or remarkable timber, including trees planted on farmers in their fields, belonged to the state. And this is actually a fairly new uh, legal reform undertaken in the mid-1980s by the government to help sort of catalyze a national timber industry. So if you're a cocoa farmer and you have a high value sort of timber quality tree on your farm, you've lost rights to it as of 1985. And a timber company could come in and take it out uh, without any compensation uh, to the, uh, the farmer. Now there's been some responses and reforms to these uh, sort of assessments. One is that we're seeing more community management agreements between the forestry department uh, and communities that give communities a certain sort of array of rights um, uh, uh, on condition that they meet certain um, sort of management standards. And then there's been some national policy reforms recently to allow farmers to have a percentage of timber re revenues and in fact to register their rights to timber quarterly trees with the local government authority. Uh, it's a somewhat bureaucratic procedure, it could be streamlined, but there is a recognition of the rights of farmers uh, to land, uh, to trees on their land. I'll talk a little bit about Madagascar. Uh, research in Madagascar has identified lack of legal recognition of customary tenure institutions as an obstacle to FLR in Madagascar. Uh, and moreover, local tree and management practices are not well understood by government authorities in many settings. Uh, these are sort of institutional rules and so on that are embedded in the customary system and there's a strong sort of, I'll use the word sort of uh, uh, bias or 
uh, you know, focus on the statutory rules governing uh, forest use, which are not really, uh, uh, you know, the, the state and the local government lack the capacity to implement those, those rules to any great degree. So there's a few solutions that we've been discussing. This is based on research with, uh, between, with, by C4 and a, a national partner, ESSA. So we're suggesting consideration of extending greater legal recognition to customary institutions. And this is a process underway really throughout Africa, uh, where customary institutions have basically existed in the shadows, if you will, uh, treated as informal and not subject to uh, the kind of uh, uh, legal recognition and status that private land or government land uh, is uh, subject to. And so we've seen important reforms in a number of countries, and actually Botswana has really had a wonderful record here of extending statutory, statutory recognition to customary institutions at a level equal to private land, private rights, uh, and government land. And this is you know, a question that would require significant discussion and, de and debate in any society. But we'll, we're seeing these processes underway in a number of countries, including in Kenya, which in its uh, 2010 uh, constitution adopted a recognized scheme to recognize customary land rights. And finally, there's a, a need to recognize and build upon local forest tenure and land use rules as a sort of entry points for introducing FLR uh, uh, innovations. Uh, and so just a few summary points here. Tenure and FLR, in practice, there are some common themes. It's important in some cases to devolve or recognize rights to land and trees. We just spoke about that in the Madagascar context and the Ghana context. In other cases, what is needed is a devolution of a broader array of rights to land as well as forest, thinking about kind of resource management in the context of integrated landscapes, which is something that is vital in natural resources management. In all cases, rights enforcement needs to be uh, strengthened, including the ability of local communities to enforce their own rights. So here's uh, <clears throat> some of the policy implications for FLR interventions. We talked a little bit about rights recognition as one thing that's important. They need to be recognized in law, but rights need to be actualized uh, in practice. Program designs that generate widely shared benefits. This is very important. The a uh, photograph you see on the screen here is of women in Nepal harvesting lemongrass in a community forest over which the community has very strong rights uh, due to uh, uh, Nepal's commitment to rights devolution, the forest which began about 25 years ago, yielding significant uh, livelihoods and environmental benefits. And there needs to be support for technical and institutional building uh, and training. And, and then, as I had mentioned early, Support for expanding forest agencies' role beyond the role of strict enforcement. So we really advocate a rights-based approach to F F FLR, a focus on community rights, gives people agency to choose and manage forests and other land uses. Evidence suggests that whether they have clear tenure and forest-related benefits, communities will choose to maintain and extend areas in land in forests. Where rights are absent, the scope for sustained uptake of FLR is probably low. If the intention of FLR is to benefit poor people and improve livelihood conditions, and it is, then FLR needs to align itself with contexts where communities have clear rights to land and forests and provide additional incentives to people to take up forest-related investments. So I've offered some uh, links here to some C4 resources on this topic. Uh, and thank you very much, especially uh, our friends at GIZ for supporting uh, some recent research in Madagascar and uh, Ethiopia and elsewhere. Uh, Steve, you were talking about the importance of land securing uh, property rights for in the case of uh, community forest uh, projects. Now, in many countries, uh, especially in Africa, uh, forests are, especially natural forests, are the property of the state. So it is very uh, in Madagascar, for instance, it is very uh, difficult to, to give local communities a property right to, to forest. You know, the state, quite sensibly, in many settings, will want to retain sort of the underlying ownership 
uh, of a resource that's of significant environmental and social uh, purpose. But it can also devolve a range of, of quite strong, if you, if you will, use rights, uh, management rights, uh, and other rights that in, involve extracting resources, for instance, harvesting timber, even in some contexts, harvesting minerals or mining uh, minerals. And so it's a matter of really a balance uh, that uh, makes sense in any given context. Now, with respect to the Nepal example that we were looking at, uh, all forests in Nepal remain uh, the property of the state in law. And this reserves for the state the, the ability to intervene or, or ensure balanced outcome. But the rights devolution program has devolved very, very strong rights to use, manage, extract uh, resources from Nepal's forest. And it's important that we think, though, about the balance of those rights. Uh, you know, if you devolve rights to a communities, uh, to forests, but then you sort of uh, burden the exercise of those rights with very onerous and costly management plans as a condition for using those resources, then you've defeated the purpose of the rights devolution in the first place. So this is what we see in many contexts, the need to get that balance right, protect the public interest on the one end, and incentivate people to invest their time, energy, and resources in managing the forest sustainably. I have one question regarding your current research in Madagascar in the Buini region, because you have been talking about customary rights and communal rights in general, but I would be interesting, interested in, in knowing what are your newest findings concerning the difference between individual rights and communal rights as possible incentive structures for potential FLR implementation? Uh, as a generalization, uh, you know, there's a very strong reliance on the statutory mechanisms for uh, securing rights. And the uh, Madagascar law uh, provides for according uh, individuals, as you suggest, but also groups, uh, a form of, uh, of collective uh, ownership that's statutorily recognized. We think that either of those models in principle can be effective, but we have two findings with respect to sort of that pathway. Uh, one is that the administrative uh, infrastructure or capacity to uh, accord rights to individual applicants or group applicants is very limited, and that will limit the ability of this particular project or the government to to deliver statutorily certified or registered rights to a meaningful number of people. So that's one consideration. The project, at the same time, is looking at these capacity issues and have ways to overcome them, and that's very, very important. So, and that should continue. At the same time, we found in our research in four quite different villages in the Buene uh, region, uh, different local level solutions to forest and resource management problems that are embedded in the local customary tenure system. This is particularly the case with three of the communities. One of them, things weren't working so well. Social, uh, uh, you know, local solutions were not being generated. Importantly, the most interesting uh, kind of, and I think most promising outcome was in two villages, our communities, where the local state authority, uh, the local recognized presence uh, or president of the community, a state official, worked very closely with local community members who were using customary rules to agree on a management plan that protected critical uh, natural resources in the landscape. For instance, in one case, raffia palms, which are important economically and environmentally, but were being encroached upon by expansion of rice, rice, uh, rice production. And what was very important here, Anna, was that the state official sort of validated the plan sort of officially. Now, it's not clear just what kind of, uh, you know, authority he was acting upon, but what we saw here was a blending of a state recognition of a local solution. 
and uh, and the solution was based on sort of customary uh, arrangements and and precedents with respect to who has access to the resources, rates of that resource extraction, and so on. So we urge a look, a closer look. I mean, basically, I think in any setting, and I, I would offer this as something of a generalization, is that in African countries, there is a statutory system. There are customary systems that stand next to those systems. And I think uh, uh, potentially productive things to do is to see how those systems interact, because they often do interact in ways that yield uh, inclusive outcomes, that is, People live in the customary system. That's just a reality. 85% of agricultural land in Africa is governed by customary systems. So to live in those systems. But the state system can give sanction uh, to those locally, those decisions taken locally. This is why I talked a little bit in the presentation about statutory recognition of customary tenure. Uh, it's a recognition that it's a system that works for people and you can elevate its status through law reform. Now, that's a big process. And in any given situation, I mean, that's a national level process. So I'm not suggesting that that would be a solution to any given problem in a project area, but it's something to keep in mind. We also had a, a collaboration with the Rights and Resources Initiative last yeah. year, and they had a look also in the Buini region. And there was also the recommendation to look further into how could we support the ministry or the policy process in um, coming up with the specific status for those community rights. So I think it is the, I think the policy level is already aware of this and it's also integrated already in the um, new policy reform that was started in 2005, but there's very little done on the ground. So what that needs, I think, is uh, those experiences coming from the locals or from the local level and then feed this into the national level as well so they can actually make use of it and create those laws that are missing. One recommendation that, that we would have at C4, based on our you know, partnership with, with yourself and your colleagues, is uh, going forward, and you've done some of this already, is to, uh, you know, for instance, work with our local research partner, ESSA, in sort of documenting these sort of local level solutions uh, that are being generated, and also providing insights to situations where solutions are not being generated. And what are the, the demographic, the social, and other factors explaining that? Uh, and then use this evidence to take into, you know, the policy discussions. Uh, because the any kind of transition from, you know, uh, the normative model of doing things, where there's a long history of, of not recognizing uh, customary systems and law, that is a, is a difficult, challenging process. Is there any experience, practical experience in African country whereby a change in land use, land tenure, sorry, a change in land tenure has impacted positively the first landscape restoration practice? Because similarly in Ethiopia, as has been mentioned, in, in Madagascar, in, in Ghana, the situation in Ethiopia is more or less similar, whereby forest landscape restoration is challenged by land tenure. There actually are examples, including, I think we'll find in, in Ethiopia, certain areas in Ethiopia, and uh, in uh, Madagascar and in other countries, I would say some of the, you know, the tropical zone countries, including DRC, Gabon, and so on, these tend to uh, evade detection, if you will, uh, because they're taking place in the context of, of the customary uh, arrangements, and we're really not looking for them. And, you know, once again, I think what, there's a diversity of, you know, there's other factors in addition to tenure, uh, which are very, uh, you know, very important here including, you know, the opportunity cost of land, demand for land for agriculture and food security, uh, demographic factors, uh, migration, and so on. Now, with respect to Ethiopia, uh, you know, Ethiopia has done actually quite, in my view, a very important work with respect to 
improving tenure security of agricultural land, beginning with the proclamation, the National Land Proclamation of 2005, I believe, which on a low cost basis uh, recognized agricultural rights without going into a titling program. Now with the 2018 Forest Land Proclamation, Ethiopia has a chance to devolve a greater array of forest rights to communities. So that's very promising. Now, Ethiopia has had something, as you know, called the um, uh, uh, Participatory Forest Management, PFM, which, you know, has been strong on the side of the capacity building and other inputs, but not strong on the side of rights recognition. And so the, the, the 2008 Forest Land Proclamation provides a, a vehicle for doing that, for devolving rights to forests. And Ethiopia has this great experience in developing the administrative architecture uh, in the whole, through the land devolution, rights devolution program, to absorb parts of that into the, um, into the uh, uh, forest land experience that they're about to embark on. Uh, you were talking about pra practices not being understood in Madagascar. Uh, not understood by whom? Was that by the government, by farmers, or anybody else? And the idea is that somehow our system that we have actually live in uh, is somehow better. Uh, but it really is a matter of insufficient familiarity with, it, with how other people address these problems. It's a learning problem, and and this is you know, we need to dedicate ourselves as development professionals. I believe, and I think colleagues would agree with this, to learning about the societies and the context in which people have often, over uh, many many decades or centuries, developed solutions to their problems. One thing that's been overlooked, and I think this is very important with respect to tenure or customary tenure is its, its most basic principle, which is customary tenure systems provide people with access to land as a social right. And that's very different from the market-based principles by which people get access to land. in, for instance, uh, Western countries, capitalist countries, and so on. Now, some would argue that, that that system is no longer adaptive to the needs of society or to development. Well, that's a fair debate. But my view is that if you're a poor person uh, or family uh, that has rights, that has rights to very few economic benefits or assets, that your right to land as a social right is fundamentally very, very important. And unless you're offering an effective alternative to the real realization of land as a social right, uh, then you're not going to get a lot of support uh, for it from people who live in villages and harvest, you know, products from forests and grow land, grow crops. It stands to reason, okay, uh, because as we're seeing in Kenya, other countries, colleagues of mine, are, you know, where there's a formalization of land rights that's offered, you see urban elites come and get that land, people who have no tie to the community or to that area of land historically, and people become further marginalized as a result. So my counsel is that some context, you know, rights formalization, as they call it, or tiling, is appropriate could be an urban context, especially where you don't have customary systems operating. Um, in other contexts, I counsel great caution, okay, and, and to think a minute about what these systems provide for people. People know what they provide. They provide uh, a chance for some kind of economic uh, well-being investment in food production and other goods and services that would not otherwise be available to them. So I think that comes back, I think, is the understanding of 
the arrangements, do we have a sufficiently uh, robust understanding of how these operate and their importance? Uh, do we have we you know are we learning, and then uh, are we acting accordingly? And so, what I'm suggesting is that there's a lot at stake, and that some of these decisions, the pathway, you know, people are very adaptive and resourceful. They find ways of evading, getting around some of these formal systems, as was the case in Kenya. Uh, and I, you know, that's another talk, another discussion in other places, because they serve their needs. Customary systems serve their needs. And over time, it may be that they'll be less effective in serving people's needs, but any kind of replacement regime has to be thought out very carefully. This is what Ethiopia did with their rights proclamation of land in 2005. Very carefully thought out approach that recce that strengthened the customary principles of access to land as a social right. They made sure that children would inherit those rights, that widows would inherit those rights. They strengthened the customary, the foundations of the customary system. Thank you very much.